So welcome back to the introduction on Python programming course. This is chapter one. In this chapter, we will look at some high-level overview of what Python is and how it works and what basic syntax constructs are that we should understand. So what better way is there than to start with an example? So imagine that I give you the following task. I give you a list of numbers and your job is to give me the average of all the even numbers in that list. So how would you go about this? Well, probably you would first ask me some questions. You would ask, what kind of numbers are in this list? Is it whole numbers? Is it decimal numbers? Is it negative numbers? How many of them are there? Okay, so I will narrow down the task a little bit. I will tell you that the task is, I give you the numbers 1 to 12, and you should give me the average of all the even numbers. So then you say, well, what's the point? I don't need to, to write a program to get to get to this solution. I can do this by hand. You know, there are six even numbers in the numbers from 1 to 12, so I can just take them, add them up, and then divide them by six, and I got the average. And I say, well, that's of, that's, that's, uh, of course true, but what about uh, if um, I gave you a list with 10,000 numbers, where every number is some number between positive 1 and positive 1,000, and I asked you to, to do the same thing. Well, then you would maybe revert to Excel or some other spreadsheet software. That, um, you know, in order to do that, I would need to give you the data in this format. Let's say it's one column in a spreadsheet. And then maybe you are an Excel wizard, so maybe you know how you could solve this using several, you know, columns of transformations of one column, and then maybe you can solve the problem. But I will show you a way here as, you know, how you can solve this problem with just a little bit of Python code. So let's look at the example. Here's a list, and I chose the list from the numbers of 1 to 12, and I uh, did not put them in order here so that we can, uh, you know, not as that so that we do not simply assume that the numbers are ordered, because that would also be helpful information in, in one way. So let's look at this list. And let's solve this problem with Python. So here you have the list of the numbers, of the 12 numbers. And what I do here is I write an equal sign and something that I call numbers. So with a little bit of uh, imagination, we can believe that this is a way of how we can create a list with those 12 numbers and assign them to a variable called numbers. That's what it looks like. So let's execute this code cell and nothing happens. So how do we know if Python has understood this uh, code? Well, we uh, just ask it for, hey Python, do you know what numbers is? What do we do? We just type the word numbers, just as we wrote it as the variable in the assignment uh, above here. We write it again, and then Python indeed confirms that uh, all the numbers seem to have been stored. And the second cell uh, seems to have something called an out, an output. The first cell doesn't. So um, it seems like in the first cell we are putting something into the memory, and in the second cell we are reading something out of the memory. So that's what we at least presume, uh, think of, of what's going on here. So now how can we use this list in numbers to calculate the average of all the even numbers in the list? So here's our first program, which does exactly that. So this code you know, it's a bit lengthy, so we will take some time to take it apart and uh, to analyze how, it, how the program works. But um, let's first just run it. And um, so we run it, and again, we don't see any output here. So why is that? Well, at the end, in the last line of this code, um, I assign to a variable called average something that I call total divided by count. And as before, I um, store in the cell, I store something in the um, variable average, and now I want to read it out. So just uh, do it as we did before. I ask Python, hey, what is average? And Python tells me it's 7.0. That seems reasonable. So if I average all the even numbers between 1 and, and 12, uh, 7.0 seems to be a, a realistic um, outcome. So let's check the code and uh, analyze what it does. So how do we usually uh, calculate an average? Well, an average is just the sum of all the individual observations divided by the number of observations. Therefore, we have to sum something up. 
How do we do this? Well, we initialize two variables that I call count and total, and we set them both to zero. And then here we see some, uh, some prose, some English comment that basically explains to us what we are doing. It says in, we initialize variables to keep track of the running total, which is the variable total, and the count of all the even numbers. And we start with the value zero for both of them. And then we enter something that we will uh, soon call a so-called for loop. So whenever we see the word for, that means some piece of code is executed several times in a row. In this case, um, um, some code is executed once for every number in the list. So the list was called numbers, plural, so that is here. So it seems like we are kind of looping over the numbers list one by one. So, and in every, in every iteration of the loop, we get back a number singular, some other variable that is you know, pointing to um, the individual number or one individual number in the list. And then we uh, see that the code that is below this four line is indented. So we have here uh, four spaces, and then in the second and third line, below the four line, we have actually eight spaces. And um, so what that means is, um, this four line means we do something repetitively, and then uh, this code, because it is indented, is the code that we are executing um, repetitively. In contrast, um, after the four line, uh, we calculate the average by total divide, divided by count, and this is in the same level of indentation as the four line. That means this last line is not executed repeatedly. It's only those three lines that are indented, that are repeated. So let's analyze a little bit more. So the next line of code, it, it reads like this. If number percent sign two double equals zero, what is that? Um, this is like the first example that is not so intuitive, maybe. But luckily, we are given a comment that explains to us what this line does. And it says, only work with the even numbers. And then we see that the code below that is indented one more level. So we have uh, here an indentation of four and then eight. So it's a one more level of indentation by four, by four space characters. So in other words, this code seems to only be executed whenever we hit an even number. In other words, the if line here checks for an individual number in the numbers list to be even. And if so, it executes code. And if not, it does not execute the code. So what code do we execute for every even number in the list? Well, first, um, we execute this line. And this line reads like this, count equals count plus one. Just by the way this is formulated, we actually know that the way we treated the single, um, the single um, uh, equal sign here must have been correct because the single equal sign cannot be read as what we know it from math. In math, the single equal sign means the left side is equal to the right side. It's a statement of truth. It's like saying both sides are equal. That's a fact, so to say. However, if we read this line in this way, we would, say, we would see that count is equal to count plus one, and this cannot be true, because if we subtract count on both sides of the equation, we would be, end up with zero is equal to one, which is not possible in math. So in other words, um, this also confirms that the way to read lines where we have a single um, equivalence uh, sign, a single equal sign, we just uh, check the right-hand side first and do the commands on the right-hand side first, and then we get a result, and the result is then stored in the variable by the name of the left-hand side. And in this line here, what we do is we read out the old value of count, which starts to be zero, we add one to it, and we uh, store it in count again. In other words, this is a counter. We increment it by one whenever we hit an even number. In other words, at the end of the day, count will be six once we, we go down here, because this for loop will be uh, looping 12 times, and six times we will hit an even number, and so six times we will add one to um, a variable that is initialized at zero, so count will be six eventually. The second line here, what does that do? Well. This is where we keep track of the running total. So remember, total is set to zero. And then whenever we hit an even number, what we do is we just add this number to the old total. And the old total plus the number that we are currently looping over will be set to the new total. In other words, that just calculates the running total. At the end of the day, uh, total 
after the for loop will be the sum of all the even numbers in this list, and count will be the number of even numbers in the list. And then we divide one by the other, and that's just the definition of an average. And 7.0 is the correct result if you do the calculations by hand. So that's our first example. So what have we learned so far? We have learned how we can create numbers. We have learned how we can collect numbers in a list. And we have seen how we can uh, execute some code repetitively. We have uh, seen an example of a condition. So uh, some code is only uh, executed if some condition is fulfilled. And then we have also seen a difference that sometimes a code cell does not produce an output, like here, the, the upper cell does not uh, produce an output, and the lower cell does produce an output. In fact, it's just us asking uh, Python, give me the value of average. So the natural question asks, when do we see output in a Jupyter notebook? So to give you another example, we have seen text before in the introduction uh, chapter, and uh, Text is anything that is written between uh, the double quotes here. So we have double quotes in the beginning and double quotes at the end, and then the word or the sentence, hello world, that's our first text, um, text data thing, whatever that is at the moment. And then we have another text, which uh, we see, in a, it's, which is on its own line, and it's also between double quotes. If I execute this cell, I only see the last line as the output. And don't be confused that whenever we uh, see text um, as a return value, as an output, there are single quotes, and uh, we use double quotes when we define text. So that's just a convention. So double quotes and single quotes in this regard work absolutely the same. They are perfect substitutes um, in this book. Um, I tend to use the double quotes as the convention. Um, this has some other reasons that you will uh, then uh, learn once you read chapter six. But don't be confused, it's the same. But what we don't see is the hello world. So the hello world seems to be gone. And um, at the end of today's chapter, we will, we will talk about uh, what an expression is in Python. And the rule for output is this. We only see as output the last expression um, of a line of code. So here, the last expression, the last line of code is just, I am feeling great, which is why we see that. Whenever we want to see more output, so whenever we have a code cell that is a bit longer and we want to see some intermediate result, we want to print it out, then we will just use Python's print function. We've seen print before as well. So what does print do? If I execute this, uh, it prints out the text we give it to. So um, note that the parentheses in, uh, in uh, this example here that's what we call later, what we will call later the call operator. And the call operator means print is a function, and we call the function. Calling is another word for executing this function. And, uh, by, and, we, and we express the idea of calling by writing open and closing parentheses. And with that, within the parentheses, we pass in uh, whatever we want the function to work on. And in this case, we want the print function to print out this text. And note, there is no out here, right? So in other words, um, I just uh, said that uh, the rule is that Jupyter Notebook will um, return to you as output the last expression in a code cell. Since there is no output here, the print function here is really not uh, an expression. It's kind of like it's something else. And uh, we will come back to that at the end of today's chapter. Um, because we need to learn uh, some other things in order to understand this fully. But just note, uh, with print, we can always uh, print out intermediate results. So let's go on. Um, Python, like basically any software that exists, uh, can be used just as a fancy calculator. And that's basically what a computer is. You know, a computer, any computer, a laptop, a web server, your phone, whatever, at the end of the day, um, they are just uh, hardware that can execute software, and you you know what um, you know from your early childhood on, or uh, from high school when you want to do some calculations in exams. Usually, you use an old-fashioned calculator, and also you have calculators on your mobile phone app, uh, um, on your mo on your mobile phones. So you know what is a calculator, and at the end of the day, any software, um, any software language, um, is. Um, also, at the end of the day, just a fancy calculator. And that's also true for Python. 
So let's do some arithmetic with Python. So let's ask Python what is 77 plus 13. I ask it and Python tells me what is 90. So here we see we get an output as well. It would be kind of weird if we wouldn't get an output here. But just note that if we had more than one additions in this code cell, we would only see a result of the last one. So whenever you can do a plus, you should also do a minus, right? And uh, this, of course, also works for Python. So in order to subtract two numbers from another, we just use the minus sign that we have on the keyword. keyword. And those two, the addition and the subtraction, um, these are two examples of what we would call a binary operator. So first, an operator uh, is any special symbol here, like the plus and the minus, that you know makes Python do some specific uh, operation. That's why it's called an operator. And a binary operator is just an operator that takes two operands. So we have one operand on the left side, the first operand, and we have a second operand to the right-hand side. And um, of course, from school, you remember that the minus sign basically has two meanings. The first meaning is we do subtraction. That's what we see here. And the second meaning is we just use the minus sign to mean a negative number. So by writing minus 1, what Python actually does is Python reads this as 1 and uh, you know creates the 1 uh, in memory. And then it gives the, the, the number 1, the number positive 1, to the, to the minus operator, to the unary operator. Unary operator because it only takes one uh, operand. And then the unary operator takes the plus 1 and makes it a minus 1 and then returns to us the minus 1 as the output. So we can use the minus with just one operand or two. This is not really surprising for you, I guess. Um, but at the end of the day, it's kind of a big deal because um, you know, uh, there's something called syntax, so which is very strict rules as to how a computer works. And if you, um, you know, develop a programming language, you have to actually teach the programming language that the minus operator can actually be used in two different ways. So let's go on. Uh, after addition and subtraction, we, can, we also want to do multiplication. How do we do that? Multiplication in many programming languages, and, and Python uh, also being one of them, is done with the so-called asterisk symbol. So sometimes we would also say it's a star symbol. It's uh, formally called an asterisk. And um, that's what we use for multiplication. So we don't use the dot that we don't uh, that we remember from school. We also don't use an X or something. It's just uh, the asterisk. So two times twenty-one is of course forty-two. Now after multiplication comes division. So what is division? Uh, division means we have two numbers and we divide the first by the second. And in this example, we have two whole numbers, eighty-four and two. And let's divide them. And I get back forty-two point zero. So uh, that's actually the first. Um, you know, example here where I, I get back a decimal number. If I go back one slide, there are no decimal numbers. So whenever I add or subtract two uh, whole numbers, I get back a whole number. And here I um, divide one whole number by another whole number. And I obviously don't get back a whole number. I get back a decimal number with the decimals being all zeros, of course. Uh, but nevertheless, it's a decimal number. And we will see some implications of that uh, soon. If you don't want that, if you don't want to get back a decimal number, you just use two slashes. So 84 divided by 2 gives us back 42 uh, still. Um, now uh, the uh, number is returned it does not have a decimal. And so that's the double slash. And the double slash is sometimes called the integer division operator, also the floor division uh, operator. And the term floor division operator may be coming from the fact that if I divide 85 by 2, what should I get back? 85 divided by 2 is, of course, 42.5. However, if I require the double slash operator to re always return a whole number, what should it return? Should it return 42? Should it return 43? Or should it maybe raise an error? Because it says, well, you, you can't do that with a whole number. So let's see what Python does. Python gives us back 42. And that's where the, in, the integer division operator receives its other name, the floor division operator, because it seems like we are rounding down. So uh, out of 42.5, which is the exact result of 85 divided by 2, we end up with a 42. So if we round it the way that we uh, learned rounding in school, 
it should be 43 actually. So it seems as if no matter what the decimal is, is, is if we get back a decimal zero or a decimal one or a decimal nine, it will always be rounded down. However, that is unfortunately not true. So if, for example, I divide negative 85 by two, I get back negative 43. So I now can tell you what the rule is for this operator. The rule is, um, if you divide two integers with the integer division operator, you get back an integer that is rounded towards negative infinity. And that means if we're dividing two positive numbers, this is as if we round it down. However, if we um, divide a negative by a positive number, then we round also towards negative infinity, which um, means we get a negative 43, which means in absolute value, we are rounding up actually. So we need to be careful here a little bit. Usually uh, it's not so important because usually uh, when we do math, we will work with the single slash, the normal division operator anyways, uh, because we don't care if we get back a decimal with a dot zero. But sometimes this will be important and then you have to know how the operator behaves in edge cases. Now we've seen uh, two different kinds of division and now we will see a third way of division. So that's the percentage sign. That's the sign that uh, we saw in the introduction example today and we didn't quite understand what it does. So now here is what it does. The percentage sign, the percentage operator is also called the modulo operator and modulo operator um, is basically the kind of division that you learn in probably elementary school, maybe early high school, where you divide one number by another and it doesn't work, um, you know, it, it's not a perfect division, so you are, you are um, uh, left with some rest and the rest is what uh, the modulo div, uh, operator returns. So in other words, 85 divided by 2 is 42 and the rest of 1 and the rest of 1 is then returned to us. So now, since we are at a business school, the question is, why would I care about this operator? Is this operator actually useful for you know, people that want to solve management problems? The answer is it's super useful. And uh, we will see many, many applications of the modular operator throughout the entire lecture. Um, but for now, it's sufficient to know that if we modularly divide a number by two, then if there's a rest of zero, then we know that the number must be even. And this is exactly what I exploited when I wrote the first example in this uh, chapter today. Um, if you divide something by two and there is no rest, we know it's an even number. And that's how we identified the even numbers. In other words, if there is a one, um, then the number is not even. The second application of the modulo operator is when I divide two integers and want to know, can the first integer be perfectly divided by the second one. So in the example, I have 49 divided by seven. And of course, 49 is perfectly divisible by seven, which is why I get back zero. So in other words, uh, if I get back zero, it also means the second number divides the first number perfectly. If I don't get back zero, uh, any other number than zero will imply that um, the number is not perfectly divisible. So, and it does not have to be one, of course. So let's say I divide by five. Um, now I will get a rest of four and the four indicates that the number is not perfectly divisible. And that is two different applications of the model uh, operator. A third one would be, let's say we are given a three digit number, seven, eight, nine, and I want to extract digits from the right. So for example, uh, I want to get the nine out of the seven, eight, nine. How do I do that? I modularly divide by 10. This is the way to extract digits out of, um, uh, an, of, out of any number from the right. Of course, if I want to extract two digits, I modularly divide by 100 and I get back 89. So we already see that even though uh, as business students, we may not be uh, super familiar with the modular operator, we already see there are some things uh, that we can uh, do with it and we will see many more applications uh, of the modulo operator. So let's go on. Now that we covered division, um, the next uh, operator we want to cover is exponentiation. So we want to raise two to the power of three. How do we do that in Python? Well, we write it with a double star, a double asterisk. So two double asterisk three 
is 2 to the power of 3, and this is 8. Note that in some other programming languages, there is uh, another uh, operator in use, which looks like this. Um, and this has the name caret uh, operator, if you want to search for it on the web. And the caret operator also exists in Python. So if I run the cell again, I get back a 1. This is, of course, not 2 risen to the power of 3. However, um, it is a valid uh, operator. So you must not confuse the double asterisk with the caret sign here. And uh, we will keep the double asterisk here. OK, so now that we have five different um, arithmetic operators, we want to you know, put them together into um, bigger um, expressions. And uh, whenever we do that, the question is, in what order are the operators um, executed? So here, I say 3 double asterisk 2 times 2. So this could either mean 3 uh, raised to the power of 2, and then the result which uh, would be 9, uh, would be multiplied by 2 to be 18. The other uh, interpretation could be we multiply the 2 first to get 4 on the right-hand side, and then we raise 3 to the power of 4 to get something bigger than 18. However, uh, we do get 18. And um, so there are two explanations for that. The first one is that uh, we just uh, execute the, this expression from left to right, in which case we would you know, end up with 18. However, Python is smart enough to know how we humans think. So in other words, um, Python does not uh, give us back 18 because it evaluates the, the code here from uh, left to right. But it does give us back 18 because it knows that the exponentiation operator, the double asterisk, always has to go before uh, we use the single um, asterisk. And whenever you end out, just use parentheses just like in math. So this makes it a bit more explicit. Um, it does not make your code smaller. It's, uh, I mean, technically, um, the, when Python reads that, it's uh, like probably microseconds smaller, uh, slower here because it has to also process the two parentheses, but it's really not a big deal. And so just put it in there and um, um, make your code more readable. And also be sure that if you put the parentheses somewhere else, you get a different result. And um, yeah, that's um, all you need to know about operators. So um, we summarize um, the arithmetic operators. They work just like as a calculator. Um, they look a little bit different. We have uh, several ways to do division. And um, also the order of precedence uh, works just like in math. And in math, it's called the PEMDAS rule. So uh, parentheses go first, exponentiation goes second. Uh, multiplication and division go uh, third, and then the last go uh, addition and subtraction, and for the last two pairs, it doesn't make uh, any difference in what order we do that. Okay, so that's um, some basic Python. So now we can work with numbers. The question that now that we want to uh, look at is uh, what happens in memory? Um, you know, as uh, business people, that want to uh, get prepared for data science um, courses, may, you, may want, you may wonder, you know, why should I care what happens in my computer's memory? Um, the question, uh, the, the answer is because sometimes when you write bigger programs, and at the end of the day you will, um, there's a good chance that um, you will make mistakes that you don't understand, and you would easily understand if you just knew what happens in memory. So for you as students, um, it may be a little bit tedious in the beginning to learn um, about a computer's memory, but it's absolutely worthwhile because once you uh, get to real life problems that you want to model, then um, this helps you to write programs that are less buggy and also um, more memory efficient. So when you want to prepare yourself for a course in data science, you also have to prepare the topic of big data. So what do you do um, when you work with data that does not fit into your computer's memory? And um, in order for you to write programs that are memory efficient, you have to know how the memory works. So how does the memory work in Python? Well, Python is what is called um, an object-oriented language. And what is object orientation? Object orientation is just a paradigm by which Python 
organizes the memory for us. In lower la um, level languages like C, for example, we would have to do everything that Python does for us uh, ourselves. Luckily, we don't have to, but still object orientation is the concept by which Python does it. So we will look at uh, now um, an example in the, um, of some very easy code and see what happens in memory. And then um, with this example that is about to come, I will tell you um, three words, uh, three concepts, the concept of an object, the concept of a type, and the uh, concept of a value. And note that these three uh, words mean totally different things. However, people mess them up all the time. And um, in order to, you know, um, write, um, you know, code that really works, I think you should uh, also um, train yourself a bit to, to use uh, um, technical terms with a very precise meaning. So let's look at the example. Let's execute the next line of uh, the next code cell. The next code cell consists of three lines. So first we um, set a variable A to 42, then we set a variable B to the decimal 42.0, and then we set a variable C to some text. So I have now already executed the cell. So let's see what happened in memory when I did that. So how does Python read this code cell? Well, first it executes the, the code cell line by line. So the first line goes first. And whenever Python hits the single um, equal sign, which we will call the assignment statement, what it does, it always goes to the right hand side first. So whenever, and I mean whenever, whenever you see a single um, equal sign, always go to the right hand side in your mind and check what is there and totally ignore what is on the left hand side. And only if the right hand side works without error, will the left hand side be looked at by Python. So what happens? Uh, Python looks at the, the 42, and it, of course, understands what 42 means. And then in memory, and now note that I draw the memory diagram, Python will create a box, will write a 42 in there, and um, yeah, that's it. And then after this box is created, what Python does, now this box is created without an error, it will go to the, right, to the left hand side and see that, okay, I want to assign this box to the variable A. So then it goes into another section in its memory where it stores all the names it knows about and it writes a name A and then it makes A reference the object. And note how I accidentally used the correct word. So uh, as I drew the boxes here in my, in my diagrams, uh, objects are boxes, um, you know, um, that's uh, basically already telling you uh, what an object is. A an, an object in Python is nothing but a box somewhere in memory that contains only zeros and ones. And because we are not studying computer science here, we don't really care about what the zeros and ones are in this box. But what we do care about is what the zeros and ones in this box mean. And in this case, the zeros and ones in this box, they mean the integer number 42 to us, which is why I put the number 42 inside. Okay, so far so good. This diagram, by the way, is not yet complete. Um, even after this code cell, we will complete it over the next uh, couple of slides. So then Python goes ahead to the second line, to the right-hand side, and he evaluates this. And here Python notes the dot, and it knows that with the dot we imply a decimal number. So Python knows that, and it goes ahead, and it makes some bigger box here, and we write in there 42.0. And then after the box has successfully been created, it goes to the list of all names, it uh, writes the name B there, and then it references the box, the object. And note how I drew this box bigger, because because the decimals, even though the decimals are all zeros, but because the decimals need to be stored somewhere, uh, Python potentially needs more space, more, more ones and zeros to model this. That's why the second box is larger than the first one. And then let's go ahead to the last line. And then I told you that whenever we hit the double quotes here, that we basically uh, model text data. So uh, what Python does here, 
it creates an even bigger box. Let's do it like this. I exaggerate a little bit, of course. And uh, I write in there Python rocks. And then we create the name C, and the name C references this box. So um, the box is, of course, even bigger because somehow we don't know what text is yet, but somehow text must need more ones and zeros than simple numbers, right? Um, even though we don't yet know how text is really modeled in memory. Okay, so now that's kind of like um, how the memory looks like. And again, just uh, to reiterate, these boxes, that is what I mean by an object. And these boxes are drawn for us by Python. And uh, Python does all the handling of the boxes for us, um, which is why we don't have to really deal with uh, a lot of these memory things ourselves. But uh, it's still uh, the paradigm of object orientation that is at work here. Then we go on. So every object has three properties. And uh, all three of them um, are important. And we will go over all of them now. And uh, I just want to emphasize every object always has all three properties. And that's um, you know, a big, big idea here. So the first property is every object has an identity. Well, just by looking at the memory diagram, I have three boxes. So they are at three different places in memory, at least in the way I drew them. So that's what I mean by identity. So the box that A references is another box than the box that B references, and so on. So just by the fact that I have several boxes, each of them has its own identity, right? So um, just like we as um, humans have an identity, and usually our identity you know, is derived uh, from uh, our name, from our birth name, maybe we change the name, but then we only have another name, but we still have the same identity, basically. We're still the same person, even though we may change a name later on in our lives. So, um, but the important fact is we have an identity, and so, so do boxes. And what is the identity of a box? Um, we can find out with the built-in ID function. So I call the function ID. It's just like calling the function print. Um, ID is, it already exists, Python knows about it, and I call the function with the parentheses, the call operator, and I pass the function, uh, the variable a. So let's execute this, and I get back this big number. So this seems random. It's important to understand that this number is both. It is not random, and b, it has no meaning. So it's just the fact that somewhere in memory, namely exactly at the address, that is symbolized by this big number. That's where the object is. So I think of objects like this. The upper left-hand corner, that's the beginning of the object. The lower right-hand corner is the end of the object. And the, um, the beginning of the object, that's the address in memory. And uh, that's, this is what we can find out with the ID function. The ID function is really not important in Python at all. I just want to point you to the fact that we could actually find out where in memory something is. And of course, um, this uh, also holds true for B and C. They also have identities, and uh, as we see, they are placed somewhere else. And um, even though we cannot interpret these numbers, um, we could at least think that uh, the one, the numbers below, they start with 140, and the, uh, the number at the top starts with a, a 943. So we could already can already see that the objects are very far away in memory, actually. And decision on where something is put in memory, that is done by Python for us. So why is identity important? Well, identity is important because um, sometimes um, I want to compare two objects, or I want to do something with two objects. For example, uh, check if their value, also a technical term, is the same. And I do this with the double equal operator. So the double equal operator is the so-called comparison operator. It uh, looks at the left-hand side and the right-hand side, and it checks if both of them have the same value. That's important. We are not checking here if the two objects on the left and right-hand side are indeed the same object. So we don't check identity here, but we do check value. In other words, uh, the double equal sign does not check if two boxes are the same box. It checks if two boxes contain the same contents, same value. 
So let's ask Python if, if A and B do indeed uh, contain the same value, and the answer is true. So in other words, Python looked at the 42 integer, and it looked at the 42.0 float, or decimal number, and um, it said that those two numbers, um, they are in fact the same. However, note that down here we have a dot zero in the box, up here we don't have a dot zero, but Python is still able uh, to tell us that, okay, those two boxes, they have the same contents. And um, in this regard, it is important to, to understand that um, equality here has something to do with how we humans think of the boxes. So we humans, we don't really care how, um, you know, how a number is stored. If we just write 42 or if you write 42.0, for us humans, it is the same. However, for a computer, um, the 42.0 needs a lot more um, ones and zeros. So for a computer, those two boxes, they, the contents, they are definitely not the same. However, the meaning of the ones and zeros is the same for us humans. And because of that, um, the equality uh, or comparison operator tells us yes. That's what the true means. On the contrary, I can also ask Python if A and B have the same identity. How do I do that? I use another operator, which is called the identity operator, which uh, is written out as the letters I and S, so the word is. So note how um, A is B. If I execute this, I get back false, because why do I get false? Well, A and B, obviously, the two variables A and B, they point at different objects. So the object A points to has a different identity than the object B points to, which is why I see false. So um, note how the double equal sign and the is word, they syntactically, they are basically the same thing. They are both operators. So before that, in the, in the section on arithmetic operators, we saw the plus sign, the minus sign, and usually it was just one symbol. But uh, we also saw a double slash, actually. So most of the operators, they consist of just one symbol. But one symbol alone is not uh, the definition of an operator. So there are many, many uh, more uh, operators than just individual symbols. Um, for example, the word is. And um, implementation-wise, in Python, some people would actually disagree with me when I say is is an operator. However, in this course, uh, we will treat it as an operator. So we will say that um, the double equal sign, syntactically speaking, so grammatically speaking, is the same as the, the word is. It's an operator that takes two operands, a binary operator. Okay, so, um, and of course, maybe one thing to note here, just in case if, um, I mean, obviously, um, if I can ask the question if two different variables have the same identity, then uh, we can expect that it is actually possible to have several names to point at the same object because otherwise it wouldn't make any sense to have this operator in the first place. And also, if two variables reference the same object in memory, then of course the value will always be the same, right? So in other words, if A is B is true, then A double equals B also must be true. So a true here uh, implies a true up here, but the vice versa uh, is not true. So let's continue. So that was the first big property that every object has, which is the identity. The second big pr uh, property every um, object has is what we call its data type. And uh, note that I also refer to this as the, um, an object's behavior. So we can ask the question, do different kinds or do different types of objects uh, behave differently when we interact with them? And the answer will be yes. And the way an object behaves when we interact with it um, is um, basically governed by what type it is. So let's see what are the three data types for the three objects that we have. How do we do that? We um, call the built-in type function and I pass it the, uh, the variable a. So I call it type of a and I get back int. And int is short for integer. And that is a data type, and uh, this type is basically a whole number. That's what uh, uh, we would understand under a whole number. That's what an integer is. So how do I do that in the diagram? In the diagrams, I usually put a little tag up here where I say 
this is an int, an int object. So let's check uh, the data types of uh, the other two objects, for example, b. What's the type of b? It is float. So uh, decimal numbers, they are represented in Python by objects of type float. Okay, so now you may wonder why is that important? So as I said, different types of objects exhibit different behavior when we interact with them. So for example, the float object b, I can ask, hey b, are you an integer? And then the answer is, if I execute the cell, the answer is true. And this makes sense, because if we look at the, the box here that b points at, it says 42.0, o, 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 and so on, so it's always o here. So uh, the 42 uh, can be seen as an integer. Or in other words, uh, when, if we cut off all the decimals, um, we would not lose, a, not lose any information here. It would still be correct. And so it makes sense uh, that we are able to ask a float, hey, are you an integer or not? And if we have a different number, let's say 42.1, um, then uh, is integer would return false here. Now, uh, regarding the syntax, um, I'm also uh, showing you a little bit uh, of what is yet to come. So b uh, here is just the variable, b, and then there is a dot. And the dot here is also an, an operator, and it's called, uh, unconvincingly the dot operator. Sometimes, more formally, it's called the attribute attribute access um, operator. And then we write is integer. And this integer is basically a function. So it's just like type above or ID or print. It's a function. And uh, we see that because I also call it. So I have opening and closing parentheses. So I call the function is integer. However, the difference between the type function uh, above and the is integer function um, below is that the type function exists uh, independent of any object. It just exists uh, in core Python. We can always use the type function. Same for ID, same for print. The is integer function only exists for float objects. In other words, um, they, these functions or this function is what we uh, will say. Uh, is bound to the object b, or to the object that the variable b references. So, um, and that's just uh, a little, you know, technical term here. And also, uh, functions that are bound to some object, they have a, you know, a different name sometimes. Formally, they are um, also called a method. So, um, at the end of the day, a method is also a function. The only difference is that the method always belongs to some object. And now you may wonder, um, couldn't I ask um, the int object 42 if it is an integer? Because you know we would expect uh, that this works. Now, that's um, you know a false friend here. Um, if we um, want to ask an integer if it's an integer, we know the answer already. The answer should be true. Intuitively, intuitively speaking, because a box of type int can only model integers. So we know even before we look at the concrete value, the contents in the box, um, before we do that, we already know that this must be an integer. And because of that, when I execute the next line of code, the next cell here, I, I get an attribute error. In other words, Python yells at me and, and says, hey, uh, I know what A is, but A doesn't know what is integer means. And um, that's basically what the error message says. So and that's the first example of an error message that we see here. And an error message always consists of uh, two things. So first we see the type of error, which is here the attribute error. And then usually uh, error messages have some descriptive error message here. Um, sometimes they are, you know, uh, not adding a lot of uh, information. So the, the word attribute error is the more important thing here, but for a beginner, this may be um, uh, easier to, to, to read. So in other words, um, you know, what Python is telling us, um, it, it says, okay, there is no attribute called is integer on the object that A references. 
And that is also why the dot operator is called the attribute access error, because this integer is basically the attribute. OK. Um, so uh, what do we take from this? Well, what do we take from this is that um, different types of objects have different methods on them. For example, the float uh, object we can ask uh, if it is an integer. For the int object, we cannot do that. So let's look at uh, our third example. Let's look at um, the object that C points to. So let's first ask, what is it? And, um, and Python tells me the type of C is uh, str. So let's write str here. str is an abbreviation. It stands for string. And uh, string is basically uh, the default type, uh, the default data type that we use to model textual data. And the word string is just an, uh, an old formal word, which uh, in more modern literature would be called sequence. And, um, but string is the historical term for text uh, strings. And we will look at text strings in much detail uh, in chapter 6. So um, for now, what we just look at, what can we do with a, 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 a stir or string object that we cannot do with int and float objects? Well, for example, we can ask C to give us back a copy uh, that is lower cased. So Python rocks, the original string, uh, had a, an uppercase P. And uh, I could you know, go ahead and, and say C.lower. And then I get back a new text string uh, where Python rocks is all uh, lower cased. In the same way, I can, of course, say dot .upper, and I get uppercase letters. And these are functionalities, behavior, so to say, that the numeric types don't have, but the text type, the, the string type has. OK, so now we understand that um, the type determines how we can interact with an object. So now the last of the three properties that every object has is what we will call a value or the object's value. And what, what do we mean by value? Well, we mean by value basically the contents of the box. And the contents of the box, they have a meaning. We know that, uh, as I said earlier, inside the box there are only ones and zeros. And the ones and zeros, they have no meaning. So for a computer, the ones and zeros never have a meaning, because a computer, at least to this day, uh, does not really you know, have the conceptual reasoning power that we humans have, at least not yet. And that's why the zeros and ones inside the boxes, they are just zeros and ones to the computer. But for us as humans, the zeros and ones, they mean something. In particular, they mean the numbers 42 in 42 in A and B here, and also the text Python box. And um, so that's what I mean by semantic meaning. This is what we humans understand of it. So how can we check the value in uh, Python? Well, very easy. So if I have a, a variable that references an object, I can get to the object's value by just uh, evaluating, that's a technical term, by just evaluating um, the variable a. If I execute to cell, I get back 42. So um, this is Python's way of telling me you know, the contents of a are 42. Note that um, the way in which Python gives me back um, the, the, the contents um, of the box is in a way that I can just copy paste back into a cell. And if I execute a cell, what happens is a new object would be created and given back to me. So this is what we call a literal notation. So if Python, um, if we can copy paste some output from Python back into the console and Python understands it, then um, this is a, a literal notation because we can literally type it into the console and uh, um, Python understands it. So Python understands the symbols. And then, of course, uh, because at the end of the day, everything that is output to us um, uh, is only just pixels and ones and zeros for a computer. So uh, the computer has to like understand it in a different way. And uh, what is the difference between an integer and the, and the float? Well, the float has the dot symbol in it somewhere. So if I copy paste the 42.0 back into the console, Python also understands it, of course, uh, and now creates a new float object with the value 42. And uh, this is also a little literal because Python uh, does understand it. And then lastly, of course, 
the value of c is just python rocks and um, here um, we uh, um, have to see uh, i also noted this earlier um, in the literal in the default literal notation of text strings uh, python outputs um, the text strings within single um, quotes and uh, in this book um, i will use double quotes when entering strings by default okay so now let's talk about uh, something else let's talk about what are formal languages and how do, do they relate to uh, natural languages so formal languages are languages that are made up that are designed basically and um, of course a programming language is a formal language but you also know other um, your other formal languages for example think uh, of chemistry in chemistry water is symbolized by the sequence h2o so what does h2o stand for so h2o stands for um, um, basically means that water is uh, or any molecule of water is made up of two atoms of uh, um, um, H, the H atom, and one um, uh, one atom of the yeah, O type, so to say, and um, they they are uh, put together, and together they make up water. I'm not a, a chemist uh, expert, so um, I I cannot tell you a lot about this. But even these languages have uh, syntactic rules. For example, the the two in H two O always uh, belongs to the number uh, to the letter that precedes it it does not belong to the letter that comes after it so the two belongs to the h not to the o and in other words we could write 2ho this wouldn't make sense in chemistry in chemistry uh, terms and uh, so that's an example of some other uh, formal language and uh, programming languages are just uh, formal languages and the big difference to natural languages is that uh, natural languages they evolve naturally and they all have rules as well but uh, the rules in natural languages they are not really strict so um, uh, I'm for example a native German speaker and uh, if you study German you will learn a lot about rules but you will learn um, at least 10 times uh, um, the number of exceptions of the rules then you will learn rules and this is probably true for most languages and uh, in programming languages or formal languages, you don't want to have uh, exceptions. So let's look at some of the rules and especially um, what happens when um, a rule is you know, not followed and results in an error. So in the beginning for uh, a programmer, um, usually um, the most common error you will make will be a syntax error, which means you type something into Jupyter Notebook and Python does not understand what you want. Whenever this happens, uh, this is most likely a syntax error. So I give you some examples. So let's say as business people, we want to uh, model, let's say, accounting software or finance software. So um, we have seen integers and floats now, but let's say I want to add up numbers that for us in the application at hand uh, mean prices of something. So let's say I want to add up two dollar prices. What can I do? Well, uh, I write two float numbers here and I um, also add to them a dollar sign, right? So why would I want to do that? Well, maybe in my accounting application that I'm going to write, um, I also will have some euro prices and I don't want to mix up dollar and uh, euro prices. So uh, maybe that's what my intention is. However, if I execute this code cell, Python doesn't uh, understand it. And the reason is the dollar symbol is uh, an invalid uh, symbol. Python just has no way to know it because it's just not defined. And Python is um, nice enough to also give us back uh, an estimate uh, of where it thinks you did the mistake. So uh, here we see that this is the code that we typed and there is a little arrow here and the arrow points at the dollar symbol. So that's Python's way of letting us know that it does not understand uh, the dollar symbol. So in other words, if we want to uh, model an accounting software, uh, we would have to use either integers or floats, and then we would have to use maybe comments to tell, to tell our reader or tell ourselves in the code that uh, we are working with dollar or euro prices or whatever, but we cannot uh, just make something up. 
Another way of a syntax error is, for example, uh, here in the for loop, where, well, what's wrong here, actually? Let's see. I execute this. And, well, basically, the end of the header line, something is wrong. And Python gives me an error, and it points here. And it says invalid syntax, but there is nothing. And what's the problem here? So the problem really is that I just forgot to type something here. And what I forgot to type is a colon. So if I type a colon here and execute again, um, the code works. And we see also that uh, here that the for loop actually does indeed loop over the individual 12 numbers and print them out one by one on a line on their own. But if I forget the colon, then I do get a syntax error. And that's a, uh, um, a rule that is common in Python. So whenever um, you use syntax, for example, a for loop, a for statement, that, um, has a, that consists of a header line and some indented code block, then it's not sufficient that you indent the code block by four spaces, but you also have to uh, end the header line before the code block with a colon. Otherwise, it simply doesn't work. OK, let's go on. Um, so what's wrong here? I did not forget the colon. So let's execute this. And now Python gives me an indentation error. An indentation error is a special kind of uh, syntax error. And it basically tells me that the command print number is um, not correctly indented. And the reason is, of course, that um, the for statement, as we have seen now, requires us to have at least one line of code in the code block that is indented. So we want to execute code repeatedly for every uh, element in this list of numbers and not just once. So uh, how, how can we fix this? Well, we just add, for example, one space here, run it again, and it works. Uh, however, the convention is to not just use uh, one space, but to use four spaces. And we see this in Jupyter Notebook, because if I have like only one space, the word print is in red. If I have four spaces, um, the word print turns green. And this is Jupyter Notebook's way of letting me know uh, that this is the, the way it wants it. OK, so these are syntax errors. And uh, again, syntax errors for us are nice. Even if, as a beginner, uh, we might get frustrated because we see many of them in the beginning, the syntax errors are nice because we will see them, actually. Because as we will see soon, there are also errors that are actually very dangerous that we don't even see that they exist because we don't get an error message. Um, so syntax errors, they're usually the easiest to fix. Another kind of error is what uh, we would call a runtime error. So a runtime error means that it's not the syntax that is wrong. So it means a, run a runtime error occurs when uh, Python indeed understands what we want from it. So it can execute the code. However, for some value, and value being something inside some box, um, it cannot do, it can't execute the code. And there's a typical example for that. The typical example is division by zero. So what should Python do here? We divide one by zero. And as we know from high school, dividing one by zero shouldn't work. So let's check what Python does. Uh, Python also raises an error here. It's called the zero division uh, error. And then it gives us the super helpful uh, message division by zero down here. So sometimes the descriptive error message, they are simply not really helpful. So what's the problem here? The problem is not the syntax. So Python understands we have a number, the one. We have another a number, the zero. And we want to divide the first by the second. So Python is, understands everything. But then it says, well, really, I don't know how to divide by zero. And what can we change? Well, we could go ahead and just add a little bit to the zero. And then uh, somehow magically it works, even though uh, this is an, not a good example because uh, if you divide by a very small number, very close to zero, um, then we get uh, what is called a so-called um, uh, overflow error. So uh, then, I mean, we know that one divided by zero basically should go to infinity, and that's what we see here. So this is not really uh, helpful either, but at least it works. And again, if I change the value to zero, then I get the zero, zero division error. So runtime errors, uh, they are characterized by the fact that the code sometimes works. It works as long as the input to the code is good. 
but once uh, the code um, is to be run with um, invalid input, then um, the, the code doesn't work. So and that's a big difference to the syntax error, right? A syntax error never runs. A runtime error means the code does run, but uh, in some uh, edge cases, it does not run. And now we have a third kind of error, which is called a semantic error. And these are the most dangerous errors because that means code will definitely run. There is no error message that we get. However, there's something uh, wrong still. So let's go to the uh, introduction example again, uh, where we want to calculate the average of all even numbers in a list from 1 to 12. And let's execute this again. And we see no result. Why? Because the last line of code is not an expression. It's a statement. So we assign some result to some variable. And we go ahead. And let's read it out. And now it's 3.5. So it's obviously wrong, because we know that the result should be 7. Um, so the question is now, what is wrong here? And if we look closely at the code, we see that the error is here. We uh, misspelled, or we, we basically m used the wrong variable here. We, we used the variable count, which works, because it exists. However, the correct version would have the variable number here. So then it works. So what kind of an error is this? Well, this is an error where uh, we can we only have to uh, you know um, we, where we cannot blame the computer or anything else. This is just a, a human uh, coding error. And uh, there is a famous example of an of an error that is kind of similar to this um, in the uh, early 2000s or late 90s. NASA sent um, some drone uh, to Mars. And uh, the drone was on its way for several years from Earth to Mars. And once it reached the orbit of Mars, it tried to land. And uh, what happened then was, uh, as it orbited Mars, it got burned. And uh, NASA lost uh, this device. And uh, then it was on the media. And then um, they found out, they did an analysis of what happened. And then they found out that some engineer when they programmed the software to, to uh, do the flight control, um, they um, did not use meters per second for some speed, but they used uh, feet or something. So they uh, used the wrong unit of account. And so uh, that is totally an, an error where you know we don't see it. No one sees um, that this error exists. The only way to find out um, about this error is if we um, take some uh, test input data for which we can calculate the output by hand and for which we can uh, then verify if our code runs correct or not. And uh, that's an example of a so-called semantic error because semantic error in the sense because there is something semantically wrong with the code. It does not do what we want it to do, but the computer doesn't see it because the computer does exactly what we tell it to do. It does the wrong computation. So how can we prevent um, Arrows were by following best practices. So what are some best practices? Um, I would just briefly show how I would rewrite our introduction example um, with uh, some uh, more, um, you know, a more advanced uh, Python uh, syntax. And uh, you don't have to understand everything here right now. It's just to show you that uh, there are best practices. So let's start again. Uh, we have our list of numbers, the numbers that were given. And then what we do is instead of looping, which we did in the introduction example, we uh, create a new list called events. And the new list is derived out of the existing list numbers. And we see there is a four inside the brackets. So um, there, is a, there is a loop going on here. And this is an example of a so-called list comprehension. And list comprehensions we will cover uh, in detail in chapter seven. So. Um, what this basically does is we look at the first list, the list numbers above, and we create a new list out of it. And what we do is we only keep the even numbers. So we filter out the odd numbers. That's what uh, this does here. So we look at the, we divide every number. We loop over all the numbers. We uh, buy the variable n. And then we look if the n moderately divided by 2 has no rest. And if it has no rest, we know n must be an even number. So we keep all the even numbers. Let's execute this cell. And now we have an intermediate result, which is a, a list called events, which is a list that only consists of even numbers. And now we can do something that, um, um, yeah, that uh, is uh, rather trivial. 
we just uh, uh, calculated the sum of all the numbers in it, and then we count how many elements are in events, and then we divide the sum by the count. And uh, we did that within the for loop by keeping track of two variables um, manually in a way. And here we just use so we, we use so-called built-in functions. Sum and len they exist in Python. They are built in, and sum takes anything um, that uh, we will soon identify to be a, a sequence. And one type of a, se a sequence is uh, the list type. So we can pass um, the list events to a sum, and that sums up all the elements. And then uh, also we can pass the events list also to len. The, uh, the length function, and this of course stands for length, and uh, is another word uh, for um, counting how many elements are in this list, and then we of course get the same result. And why is this better? Well, it's better for two reasons. First, we use built-in functions, which means uh, the code runs um, faster than the for loop that we wrote on our own. Um, and um, second, we know that sum and length, they work, they are tested, we know they are correct. So um, that's uh, always good if you write, we, you, the goal is always, the best practice is to write um, as few lines of code as we can, because with every line of code that we write to solve a problem, there is one more line where we can actually make a, a bug. And um, we don't want that. So we want to uh, code as few lines as possible. That's usually the goal. And that's also something as a beginner that you have to fight, right? Your instinct is you want to write lots of code because you like uh, coding early on and you want to, uh, show yourself how good you are, so you want to uh, uh, write many lines of code, but the best practice is to have as few lines of code as possible. And then th this is one aspect, so um, some the built-in functions, some and then they are more performant, they are correct. And then there is a second aspect to all of this, and I would uh, argue that this way of writing uh, the problem is more expressive. So uh, what do I mean by that? Well, we start with the list numbers, and then we express the idea that we take these numbers and we uh, filter out the odd numbers and are left with another list that is uh, um, consisting of only even numbers. That's like the first step. And then the average step is also very expressive in that we say, well, the average is just the sum of something divided by the count of something. So we don't have to keep track of a running total. This is a way easier to read and understand. And uh, so that's also a nice side benefit that we have here. Okay, let's continue um, a little bit with um, some other example. Um, and uh, we will uh, introduce some more words, and some more technical terms. Uh, in particular, we will now look at the left-hand side uh, of an assignment statement. And we will analyze what are variables. So I've used the term variables before. Um, and then there are also two other uh, names, call, uh, words called named and identifiers that are closely related. And then uh, there's also another term called references. And uh, yeah, we will now look at um, how do these terms relate to each other. And again, uh, as I said before, um, in this course, I will try to you know, uh, use uh, technical terms with a very narrow and a dedicated meaning. So a variable will be something different than a name, and this also will be something different than a reference. So con let's continue with an example. Let's create a variable called variable and um, assign to it the float 20. Let's execute this. What happens in code? What happens in code is um, some rather big box is created. We write 20.0 in here. We know by now that this is a float type, so we put the type here. And then we go, that this is what happens on the right-hand side in the memory. And then on the left-hand side, where we have a list of all the names we know about, Python will go ahead and it will um, write a name called variables. And then, uh, then we create this arrow that points from uh, the name to the box. And this is what happened uh, in this line of code. And now um, to... Um, it, um, to introduce the technical terms. The word variable here, this is what we mean by name. So there is a, in somewhere in Python, there um, is a list of all names that Python knows about, and we can um, change this list a little bit by, for example, the assignment statement. So what we do here is we create a new name called variables, and then this name uh, points to some uh, object in memory, and this uh, pointing, this arrow here, 
This is what we mean by a reference. So um, this is the name, the arrow is the reference, and then both of them together, this is what we mean in variables, what we mean with the term variable. So a variable is always a name pointing somewhere. And a name uh, does not necessarily have to point somewhere. We will see uh, um, examples where a name in the list of names in Python may not have a reference. So uh, we really, I really want to emphasize the name and the reference are two different uh, concepts, although in most applications and most examples we will see them uh, together all the time. So um, let's go on. Variable is now 20.0. So let's go ahead and now um, uh, assign to the variable a variable again. Now this time the integer 20. I execute this line of code and now the question is what happens in memory? Well, what happens is this. Python creates a new box that is definitely smaller than the first box and writes the term 20 in there. So this is the integer 20. And then we label the box with the int type. And now the question is, what happens? Python tries to set up a name variable that references this object. So, so um, um, then Python goes ahead and sees that there is already a reference there. So what does Python do? Well, Python goes ahead and removes the reference here and then creates a new reference to the new object. And now you may wonder what happens to the float, the float 20.0. The answer is, we don't know. We cannot tell. Python will, in regular intervals, execute something that um, we call um, garbage collection. And what that means is Python will, in regular intervals, go through the memory and check if there are any objects that have no reference to them. And if it finds an object where there is no reference to it, then it will remove them from the memory and clear up the memory so that uh, other objects can use um, the new space, the free space. However, this does not happen immediately. So it could be that after we create the int integer 20, that the float 20.0 will still uh, float around in memory uh, you know, for some time. However, because we have no reference going to this float, what we can do is we can pretend as if the float was removed right away because we cannot reconstruct it. We, have no, we will not have any way of um, creating, of getting back to this uh, object. Now, let's continue with the code. If I now execute the next cell, um, the variable is now 20 and not 20.0 anymore. In some programming languages, uh, this would not work. And the reason why is, because in some other programming languages, the type of something, the data type of something, is attached to the variable. In Python, this is not the case. As we have seen in Python, the type of a variable is attached to the object itself here, int. And because of that, uh, I can do what uh, um, I could uh, summarize as this. I could say in this example that I created a variable uh, with the float 20.0 and I changed the type of the variable to end. However, uh, as we saw the diagram in memory, we know that this is just you know not correct because we did not really change the type of the variable. We also did not change the type of the float object. In fact, we created a new object that just happens to have uh, ones and zeros in it that mean the same as the ones and zeros in, uh, in another object. That's all we did, but we did create a new object. And then we uh, moved arrows, we created a new reference and we removed an old reference, but we never changed the type of anything. So types, they uh, always belong to the, to the object and um, any variable can in its lifetime uh, reference objects of different type. And that's something other programming languages, many other programming languages cannot do. And that's also something that I would not recommend you should do all the time. So um, having a variable point to uh, different types of objects within uh, the same code base is kind of like, it makes the code base harder to read and harder to understand. It's possible as we see, but it's not really recommended. Okay, let's go ahead and uh, do something with the 20. For example, I execute the next code cell, which reads uh, like this, variable, uh, asterisk equals four. And now this asterisk equals seems weird. So 
whenever you see a single um, equal sign, the uh, assignment statement, and we prepend it with an operator, like the asterisk in this case, what this really means is, this really reads like um, what is here written as a comment, it, uh, it reads like we set um, two variable, whatever var variable was, times four. In other words, the variable name on the left-hand side will be inserted as the first operand on the right-hand side. That's just an abbreviation. So this is shorter than this, but it's exactly the same thing that, ha that is happening. And um, sometimes we'll call this um, to uh, update a variable. But we don't really update a variable. We, um, we will, what we will see, we will create a new object. So let me, um, let me execute this code cell and let's see what happens in memory. Well, what happens is Python follows the, the name variables to the, to the object, 20, and then multiplies it by four. And 20 multiplied by four will give me A, right? So what Python will do is it will create a new box and it will write 80 in it. It's also an int. And then Python goes ahead and removes the reference. And then Python will reference the 80. And as we said, because there is no more reference to the 20, we pretend as if the 20 is deleted right away. OK, so let's check if we calculate this correctly. Yes, variable is no 80. And now we go ahead and we um, divide variable by two and then assign the result to variable again. So we also use this uh, short form of the assignment operator. Sometimes these, uh, these uh, assignment statements with a prefix of an operator, they are also referred to as augmented assignment statements. So let's execute this. So what does it do? So we follow variables again to the 80 and then we divide 80 by two and we use a double slash meaning we will get back another integer. So 80 divided by two will give me a 40. So let's draw a new box, 40, int. And now this reference will go away. We pretend as if the 80 is gone right away too. And a new reference is created, okay? So that's how memory works and note how Every time we execute one of these statements, a new, a new box, a new object is created. So um, that is, um, yeah, just something to know. And then one last time, we add two to it. So what we do is we follow variables again, two to 40, we add two to it, which makes it, um, let me see, this makes it uh, 42, of course, and it's also an int. And then one last time, this reference gets removed. We pretend as if the object is gone, and then a new reference is created, which uh, references the new 42 object. And indeed, the variable is 42. So this is what uh, happens in memory. Okay. So now, um, what we can do is we can, of course, um, uh, reference variable again, it's 42 because I mean, I didn't change anything here. And then we can ask the question, can we remove the reference without creating a new object? So can we just delete the reference? And of course we can do this. Um, we do this with the del statement. So by saying del variable, what happens in memory is this. Uh, Python goes to the list of all names it knows about. It checks if there is a name called variable finds uh, the name variable and then it deletes the name variable and also at the same time it removes this reference so the reference is gone and then python sometime later runs its garbage collector and the garbage collector checks are there any objects that have no reference to them and then the garbage collector will find the 42 and will of course get rid of the 42 as well however the del statement is in my opinion um, misnamed a little bit because we don't really delete uh, something here. What we do here is we dereference. Uh, well, I mean, we, we could say that we delete something, but we don't delete objects. The only thing we delete really is the name, right? And by deleting the name, 
we uh, get rid of the reference, and only if the, uh, we remove the last reference to an object, this object gets removed. So please don't read the del variable statement here as uh, we delete the, the object. That's not what's going on. We only delete the name from the list of all names. And then, of course, um, if we try to look up variable after that again, uh, Python does not know about it and gives us a name error. And that is why um, in previously I referred to this as uh, names here. And remember the, the uh, title of the last uh, section here in this chapter was uh, um, uh, titled variables versus names versus identifiers versus references. And um, one reason why I prefer to use the word names here and not identifiers is because in most of the error messages that Python prints to us, it uses the, the word name and not identifier, but uh, the words names and uh, name and identifier are usually uh, considered uh, synonyms. So um, yeah, that's uh, maybe uh, also something to note. But uh, again, um, as I said earlier, we call this here the name, the error we call the reference, and together the two we call them variable. The term, uh, the technical term identifier is not so uh, important in this course. Okay, so now comes um, a section that usually confuses people, but um, I will uh, show you in a way with the diagrams so that uh, you are not confused. Okay. So let's go on. I give you an example. And the example goes like this. We set the variable a to the object, to the integer object with the value 42. So what happens in memory? Well, what happens in memory is this. We create the 42 here, for example here. Of course, an integer, and then we create the name a and make the name a reference 42. This is what happened. And let's go on and execute the next line of code, which says we set b to whatever a is pointing to. So this next line does not mean that a and b are the same, it means we will set b to reference the object that A currently references. So what does that mean? Python goes into the, in the list of all names, it looks up A, it finds that here is this object, 42. So this is what happens by when Python evaluates the right-hand side, right? It, looks, it just looks up the A, it ends up here with the 42, and then once the right-hand side is done evaluating, uh, Python will take the object it has and will assign it to the variable B. So we are here at the 42, so that means we create a new name called B and make this point to the same object that we currently evaluated. So uh, now we have a situation where we have two names referencing the same object in memory. And let's go ahead in the code. Let's evaluate what is B. Well, B is of course 42. This makes sense. So let's go ahead and set A equal to 87. So what happens now? Python goes ahead and uh, creates a new object with the A78 in there, uh, 87, and uh, labels it with int. And now we want to set this object um, to, the, to the name A. What Python does is it recognizes that there is already a reference, so it deletes this reference, and then it creates a new reference to this. And what we see in the diagram is that B is still referencing the 42. That's important. So if I now go ahead and ask Python, hey, what is A? Python tells me A, a is 87. And then I ask Python, hey, what is B? It will tell me, hey, it's still 42. So uh, some people are confused when they see uh, the code here on um, the presentation because they say, well, aren't B and A supposed to be equal? Well, yes, they are equal, but only in the, in the moment when we set them equal to each other. Uh, once we uh, continue with uh, execution down here, A and B may certainly uh, point to two different uh, objects again. And this is exactly what happened here. 
Okay, and now comes the funny part. So, the funny part is, we do the same exercise again, just with a list. So here, I create a list with the numbers 1, 2, 3 in it, and I, uh, make, uh, I, I basically make a variable called x uh, reference them. So how do I, create, how do I uh, draw lists in uh, my memory diagrams? Well, we haven't done this before, so this is new. So what Python does is Python goes to the right-hand side and it evaluates the right-hand side and it sees the brackets. And that is uh, the, uh, the indication to Python that, hey, uh, please create a list object. And then Python counts how many elements will be in the list, and it will be three. So um, uh, Python must reserve enough space to fit three elements inside. However, what Python really does in memory is this. It creates a thing that is very long, and we will give it several so-called slots. And these slots, these are basic places where we can put something in, and this makes sense because we are creating a list object, so we want to store many, many things inside the list object. And these slots, they are the same distance, right? That's important. And also note, Python, um, Python is well aware that we only want to put three elements inside, but it creates many more slots. How many is not important. It's usually a number um, that is well-defined, um, and it's usually higher than whatever we want to put inside. And it differs, it depends on how big of a list we want to create. But the only thing that we, uh, for now, um, need to understand is Python creates this thing here with slots. And such a thing, which has um, um, these slots, this is what in computer science literature is uh, called an array. And then Python goes ahead and uh, with, the execute, with the evaluation, and it evaluates the one, the first element. And what it then does is it creates a new object with a one and puts in here. And then it goes back into the, the first slot and it makes a reference from the first slot to the one. Note how I use a European style one here. This is not a seven for American people. Um, maybe I should uh, in future use the American one with just a um, one uh, mark from top to bottom, but uh, that's supposed to be a one. And then what Python does is it goes to the next element, the second one, and what it will do, it will create a second object. So let's say it creates an object with the value two in it, an int object, and you will make this point here. This is how it works. And then one last time, it looks at the third element, which is the number three. So it will create another object and make a third reference. And now, the list is basically done. And only now that the right-hand side is totally evaluated, will Python go ahead, and there was no error, so now Python will go ahead and will create a name called x, and x will point at the beginning of the list. That's it. That's what lists look like um, in memory. So now you may wonder, what is the type of a, of a list? Well. Unsurprisingly, the type of a list object is just list. So we may um, put a tag here and write list in it. And now we have a list um, of three elements. And now we do the same, um, the same um, step as before. We create a new variable called y, and we make it also reference x. So what, what happens here, Python will evaluate the right-hand side, so it will follow the x and it will get to this object, to the beginning of the list object, and then evaluation uh, of the right-hand side is done. And then it will take the reference to this object and will assign it to a new name called y. So it will create a new name y, and will basically make this point here as well. Okay, so same as before, um, and uh, now we do um, the same as before, just a little different. First, let's just check Okay, maybe I should execute everything in order. So now, y is a list, one, two, three. But the important thing to know is, even though I have two variables, x and y, I only have one list in memory. That's important. So now what can we do with lists? 
Well, lists are there to collect several elements inside one object. So maybe we want to um, access the individual objects. We have seen one way to do that, that was with a for loop. Uh, we can loop over a list. But there is another way to get to the individual elements in the list, which we call indexing. So indexing is done with the index operator, which is brackets. So we write x, which is the reference to the, to the list. And then we write brackets, opening brackets and closing brackets. And this is the so-called indexing operator. And um, in the indexing operator, we have to provide an, a whole number, an integer, because indexes, they, that's basically, they are, <laughs> they are just whole numbers. And now there is one thing that you need to understand, and this is uh, not rocket science. In Python, we start counting at zero. So the first element here, the one, will get an index of zero. Maybe I can write an index here. Then maybe I have an index of one here, and maybe I have an index of two here. So these are the indice indices. And um, so if I want to access the first element, how do I do that? I tell Python, hey, please go to the list, um, to the list object called x, and give me the first element. So let's execute this, and I get back the number one, which is exactly this one here. Uh, that's indexing. Some other languages, uh, like R, for example, but also I think uh, Julia, they start to count at one. Some languages start to count at zero. It really depends. Um, it's really not a big of a difference, but you have to know, because otherwise you will make uh, off by one errors when you index. And then, of course, what can we do with that? Well, we can use the indexing operator on the left-hand side of an assignment statement as well. So here, what I do is, um, I create a new number called um, with the value 99, and I will assign this to the first slot in the list x. Let's execute this. Now, what, what happens in memory? Well, we evaluate the right-hand side first, and this basically creates a new object, 99. It's also of type int. And then Python will go ahead and say, well, now that I have the 99, um, let's make the reference, the first reference in the x list, a reference it. So what will happen is the old reference is deleted, and a new reference is created. And now, because there is no further reference to the one here, we can pretend that the garbage collector just removes it. And now, the tricky part is, if I now ask x, what is x? Um, uh, I get back a list with a 99 in the first element, but also if I ask Python, hey, what is y? I also get back a 99. But now I cannot really surprise you at this, um, uh, at this time because I drew the, the diagram in memory, but if I uh, did not, if I did not uh, um, uh, draw uh, this diagram, and if you uh, were just given, you know, uh, this code here, most uh, students, most beginners, will expect that this 99 here, uh, in the first element of y now, remains to be 1. And, and they are confused that this is also 99. But uh, with a memory diagram, um, we are basically, we are not in a position where we can get confused at all, because we know to begin with that we only have one list object which just ha happens to have two names, like a, a real name and a nickname, so to say. And just by changing something via one, one name does not mean that we don't see the change via the other name. In fact, we do see it. So um, that's why we see it here. OK, that's it. And um, that was the, a bit tougher example, but I think also quite easy. And now let's get back and um, um, close up uh, this chapter by coming back to um, a question that I raised uh, in the beginning. So in the beginning, when we looked at what is uh, considered output in, Py in Jupyter Notebook especially, I told you that only the last expression in a code cell is given back to us as output. So what does that mean? Let's I will give you an example. So um, if I uh, go back uh, in memory, to, to this uh, situation, which is still uh, the current situation in memory. If I evaluate what is A, I get back an 87. Why? Because before that, 
I made A point to an object with the value 87. That's an expression. So why is that an expression? Well, because I don't change anything. I don't instruct Python to make any permanent changes in memory. And that's exactly what is the definition. It's, it's, it's a, a rather, you know, it's a bit of an abstract thing here, but it's actually not so hard. So an expression is any, is anything, any combination of a variable with an operator with a literal um, that does something that gives me back some value that evaluates to something, but does not have permanent side effects. That's an important uh, part of the definition. So when, when I just read out the variable A, Python goes and looks up the, the, the variable A, it will follow the, the reference to the 87, and then in a way, that this is how sometimes I like to draw things, it takes the 87, and I draw this in red here, and it gives it back to us, because we are asking for it, right? So that's what Python does here. This is why here in red as well, um, Python gives us back the 87, because why? Well, I asked for it. I say, Python, please evaluate this expression, and Python evaluates the A by looking it up, by following it to the 87, and then finally giving it back to us. So we say that the variable A evaluates to 87. That's what we would say, and uh, that's what we get back. Now an expression uh, can also be a literal. So if I just type 42 and execute this, I also get back 42. This is almost trivial. Without a memory diagram, I wouldn't even know if, uh, how I could present this in a presentation here, because uh, this is so trivial. If I say Python, hey, Python here is 42, and it gives back to me the 42. So what, what's going on here? Why is this? Why do I put so much emphasis on this? Well, what happens is, um, when I type 42, what Python does is, it reads the 42, and that's what we mean by evaluating. It evaluates the 42 that I typed in, and this leads to a new 42 object being created which is also of type int, and then the evaluation is done. So the object is here, and whenever the evaluation is done, the last object that was um, um, you know, retrieved in the evaluation process is just given back to me as the user, as the one that asked for it. That's why I see the 42 here. And then what happens is, because I don't store away the 42, because you know, it, I'm giving the 42 back and I'm not, putting a reference back to the 42. Because of that, the 42 is basically immediately forgotten. Um, and then, of course, this we can also now uh, cross out. So this is what just happened. And if I go ahead and I uh, run the cell again, now, not, now, there's now, now it says 92 in it. If I run the cell with the um, literal 42 in it one more time, it says 93. So what happens is Python goes ahead, it reads it, creates a new object which has a 42 in it again. It uh, labels it with int, and then it gives it back to me like this. I see it as the output, and because I don't store it away, it's immediately forgotten. At least I have to assume it is immediately forgotten. So this is how we should think of uh, uh, what happens in memory, right? Um, this is uh, uh, just a side note. Um, Python has some uh, optimization going on, so especially for small numbers, this is not what actually happens in memory. So small numbers like 42 and 87, they only exist in memory once, and we always get back the same number. Um, but I want to teach you a mental model here of how you should think of uh, you know, what the evaluation process is and how objects behave in general when they're not somehow optimized by Python. And this is how we should think of it. So whenever we say, we evaluate something, or Python evaluates something, it basically means we do something in memory, and maybe along the way new objects are created, just like the 242s here, and then the last object of the overall expression is uh, just given back to me, uh, which I indicate with the red arrows. I will usually not uh, draw the red arrows because you know it's just too, too much to draw, and it's also trivial. But after this last uh, um, object is given back to me and I don't do anything with it, I don't store it, then I can assume that this object is immediately forgotten if, of course, not some uh, other uh, reference is going there, which was the case for the 87. So let's go on. So let's write another expression. I said 
An expression is anything that consists of variables, literals, so meaning numbers, op and operators. So connect by operators. So here I have a variable minus the 42. So I have a variable, I have an operator, and I have a literal. So I execute the cell, I get back 45. So what happens here? Well, what happens is Python goes ahead, it follows uh, the A to the 87, and then it also goes ahead, that's the, the left-hand side of the operator, and then it evaluates the right-hand side of the operator, and the right-hand side of the operator immediately creates a 42, and then Python somehow uh, looks at the 87 and the 42, and it knows it has to subtract uh, one from the other, so um, the subtraction is done, and the subtraction leads to a new object with the value of 42, because that's the result, and then um, the result is what is actually uh, returned to me, and that's what I see as the output. And then, of course, the intermediate result, the 42, that I had to create in memory here, this gets actually uh, removed because it was never, um, you know, never referenced by anything. And then, of course, because I don't uh, store away the reference to the 42, the 42 object uh, also gets removed here. However, um, the 87 object, because it still has the A reference here, does not get removed. So this is what happens in memory every time we um, execute one of these cells. So um, when I said that uh, an expression is any, uh, any code that does not have a permanent side effect in memory, I did not mean that there is no side effect at all in memory. In fact, we see side effects. The, the thing is, the side effects that we see in memory, they um, are basically forgotten because if we don't, uh, if we don't store away uh, to retrieve this result, then how should uh, Python, you know, keep track of it? You know, why should it keep track of it? It's an intermediate thing. It's for more, for immediately forgotten. That's how it works. And of course, one more example here. Um, if I have uh, a minus 42, I can also um, uh, divide it with uh, integer division by nine. I get back five. And this is to illustrate that the um, definition of what, what is an expression is also recursive. So A is an expression, 42 is an expression, but also uh, the A and the 42 um, as operands to the minus operator is an expression. And then also if we use this expression here and we put it in parentheses and we continue to calculate with it, divided by nine, the entire thing is also an expression. And in this context, we would probably call this here a sub-expression because this expression is evaluated first and then the result of this, the, 40, the 45 object, is divided by the 9 and this results in a new object, the 5, and then after the 5 is returned, everything is basically forgotten, everything except the A. So this is how evaluation works uh, in memory. And usually um, these subtleties are not so important to know, but I want to emphasize them here in this chapter uh, early on so that you know when I um, speak of an expression, what do I mean by expression? This is what I mean. Is I mean some, something that happens and it does, you know, something happens in memory and it does not have a permanent side effect. So um, what, what if there is a permanent side effect? Or um, let me ask the question in, a, in another way. What is, a uh, what is a permanent side effect in memory? Well, this is what uh, we would understand um, uh, or this is what we would call a so-called statement. So statements is a more generic um, uh, thing here. It's more generic than um, the expression. So we have seen statements before, for example, most notably the assignment statement. So here, the 42 on the right-hand side, that's an expression. So a new 42 object is created. That, this is what we mean by evaluating the 42. So the 42 gets evaluated to some object. And then the reference to this object is assigned to A. So what this means is, uh, here currently in my memory diagram, the A points to 87, and after executing the code cell that we have here, what happens is, um, let me see, do we have space? Maybe here. Um, a new 42 object is created one more time. And then because the A references the 87, this reference is now removed. And because we have no further reference to the 87, we can pretend that the 87 is gone as well. And then 
uh, a new reference is uh, put here to the A, and this reference is the 42. And now note that because I have this arrow here, I have a permanent side effect. So before I executed the cell, um, A was pointing to 87, and after executing the cell, A is pointing at 42. So that is a permanent side effect. And whenever we have a permanent uh, side effect, um, this means we don't have an expression, and, and most of the time, um, this basically constitutes what, what is called a statement. In this case, the assignment statement uh, is called statement because it is a statement. So that's a, um, a grammatical subtlety here. Uh, in the beginning, it's not so important that you understand all of the uh, more abstract ideas here, but I just want to uh, raise uh, um, a certain amount of awareness that um, you know that there are such concepts. And then, of course, another statement that we've also seen before is the del statement to dereference a variable. So by saying del a, that what happens is the, the name a gets removed from the list of all names, and the reference to the 42 also gets removed. And because there is no further reference, the 42 is forgotten. OK. So and that means because we deleted the name a, we also have a permanent side effect, right? The name A was there before, and now it's not uh, there anymore. So this is a permanent uh, side effect. Okay. And lastly, to finish today's chapter, I want to just quickly uh, talk about comments. So we have seen comments in the in the introduction example in the beginning, uh, where we basically wrote what uh, some piece of code does. So usually, um, uh, how we use comments is like this. Well, first, what is a comment? Uh, a comment is anything uh, that begins with a, a pound sign or a what we would uh, also call a hashtag. And the convention is that uh, if we start um, a comment at the end of a line, we uh, only we use two spaces here before the hashtag and one space after. And um, then we write something in the in the comment. And sometimes that's one way of writing a comment at the end of a line uh, to refer to the uh, line as such. So here, what we do is we say we have a distance and we have time and we say how are they measured. They are measured in meters and seconds. And then sometimes we use comments um, in a longer uh, version and then we put them on a line on their own. And uh, for example here, calculate the speed in kilometers per hour. And uh, we would also have a hashtag here and we would also uh, describe this code. So let's run this code and nothing fancy here, but this is just the rule for um, hashtags or for comments. And then, of course, um, how should you use comments? Well, you should use comments to put information in your code that uh, helps you yourself in the future to understand what you wanted to do with some you know, certain uh, code. Uh, for example, here, uh, I calculate seconds. Uh, I calculate 60 times 60 times 24 times 365. And obviously, this is the number of seconds in a year. And so I call. Uh, the variable seconds, but then I put a comment here that this means seconds in year. And this comment, this comment here is kind of uh, useless. I think it's uh, you know overdone. There's a better way um, to do this in this situation. May maybe just rename the variable to seconds per year, and uh, then you don't need a comment. So uh, the the rule for comments is this: don't use too many comments, but also don't use too few comments. Um, use comments mainly to write down why you are doing uh, something or what you're doing, uh, what in terms of uh, what are you doing conceptually. So uh, in this um, uh, case here I write, I calculate the speed in kilometer per hour. I could also write uh, convert something from, I don't know, miles per second to kilometer per hour, whatever. Something like this I can write in a comment. I should not put a comment here that says calculate the speed. Well, because I can read it on my own that I'm calculating the speed. So the comment has to kind of make sense. And um, yeah, I would always recommend in the beginning to uh, do you to start using comments from the beginning on, so that uh, a day from now you can uh, also still understand uh, what you actually meant when you wrote um, a piece of software. Okay, so this concludes um, this uh, first chapter. So I ho hope you learned a lot. This chapter again. Uh, was rather high level, so we will look at many, many details in the next couple of chapters. And um, yeah, so it's not 
necessary that you really understand everything in this chapter in uh, uh, much detail, but you should get a